Hey everyone, James Azar here with the CyberHub Podcast. Welcome to this week's Tech Corner. We are back from vacation. I'm back from Israel. I'm back in the great United States of America. Joining me today is the one, the only, the legend, Roger Grimes. He's the data-driven defense evangelist for Know Before. Roger, welcome to the show. How you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. I do appreciate it. Um, I'm so excited for this episode because unlike all other tech corners, today we're gonna to be talking about data-driven defense. And there's a lot in that statement, but before, just to give you a little background on Roger. So Roger has been doing this for a really, really long time. I won't give away his age, but it's over 30 years. I got grace too, Roger, I got grace too. So grace, the gray hair doesn't count anymore. There are 20 year olds with gray hair today. You walk That's to a good. college campus, there's 25 year old kids with gray hair. Um, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in an age where you get gray hairs very, very young now. Um, but to, to Roger's name, there are, he's authored 12 books. He's authored over a thousand magazine articles, all on computer security. He's spoken at some of the largest events. In fact, he's actually speaking at Black Hat virtually this year um, as well. And you I mean, you've done NPR, you've done Newsweek, you've done a ton of radio. Um, you've worked with some of the world's largest companies, uh, Foundstone, McAfee, Microsoft, you've been everywhere you hold several certification including cpa cisp cisa sysum ceh ms mssc security and security plus and yada 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 and many 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 more so your credentials are not to be doubted with folks this is the real mccoy roger welcome to the podcast thanks you i've neglected my family you know a lot that's what that means you know i think in a, in, a, in a distinguished career like yours, there are often the unspoken heroes. That's always typically the family that's been supporting you in your drive and in your, in your mission. And so, you know, to the Grimes family, we are grateful for your sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, let's talk a little bit about, you know, data-driven defense. Sure. Uh, so uh, an average CISO today has... I'd say what, 15 dashboards on average? Wow. More or less? I did not know that, but that sounds, uh, that sounds about right. When you think of all the different tools um, that come into play, right, um, for a, a chief information security officer and all the different data points that come in, none of them are centralized. So you'll have from your EDR and MDR, and you'll have a dashboard there, and you'll have another dashboard from your different endpoint security providers, and you'll have, you know, more dashboards for, uh, you know, your 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 threat intel, your notification systems. I mean, the Lord knows we get a ton of data. An average CSO today is has actually an overflow of data. How do you start to kind of develop this whole data driven defense strategy? Well, you know, it actually, I wrote a book on it called Data Driven Computer Defense, but it really came out from that idea that we have so much data that it really overwhelms making the right risk management decisions. You know, computer security is all about risk management, but you're, we're so overwhelmed with data. Like there is 12,174 different vulnerabilities announced last year that we know about hundreds of millions of malware programs, every, you know, nation state attackers, script kitties, ransomware attacking us, and trying to sort through all that, you know, it's not a, very few people have a lack of data, it's that they don't know how to get useful information out of that data. So that's what I kind of looked at is that, I was wondering why, like when I went to companies and I would say something like, and I'm going back a few years here, but I'd say, hey, your number one problem is, and you've been broken into three times because of unpatched Oracle Java, you need to fix Java. And I would tell them that, and they would agree that that's what they needed to do to stop being infiltrated all the time. And then I'd come back there six months, a year later, and they didn't fix it. Matter of fact, in twenty, on the average year, I would probably do security consulting with anywhere from a dozen to over 100 companies, often doing uh, incident response stuff and, and security reviews. And almost every company out of the 20 years, when, when I would tell them this is what you need to fix most, Almost none of them ever did it. Matter of fact, out of my 33-year career, only one company ever did 
what was needed as the primary cause of their problems. And I was like, why is no one doing? And when I talked to other computer security people like yourself, they would share, uh, share similar stories. So it wasn't just me. So what I found out was it was overwhelming amount of data and people really weren't able to see what are the big things. And what I found out, I actually did research for 10 years, a lot of it while I was at Microsoft, I was at Microsoft 12, and found out that uh, everybody's so overwhelmed that they don't realize that one or two or three things compromise almost all the risk in most organizations. Uh, you know, for example, 70 to 90% of most uh, data breaches are due to social engineering. 20 to 40 percent are due to unpatched software and then there's a third thing that third thing tends to be different from different firms sometimes it's insider attack sometimes it's password attack sometimes it's a denial of service uh, attacks or something but everything else after those two or three things only accounted for one to ten percent of the risk yet almost all the money in their budget is not spent on those top three things and that, you know like let's say social engineering being you know, number one, the average IT budget probably spends three to 5% on it, even though it's 70 to 90% of the risk. And you don't necessarily have to spend 70 to 90% of your budget on it, but probably more than 3% on it or 5%. <laughs> so that's where, uh, you know, I started to realize that, that leaders, CISOs and stuff were so overwhelmed with so many data, so much data and dashboards. Like I was surprised by how many times I would go to the CISO and go, hey, your number one problem is you're not patching right. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, we have 99% patching rate. You know, we, we, we pretty much have that covered. I'm like, yeah, but the 1% you don't have patched is Oracle Java, and that was responsible for 91% of the successful threats against your company last year. You're like like, like the, the IT people didn't even know to tell the leaders. So like if you went, you as a leader, you're trying to fight everything. But if I, as a person, had the data went, hey, 91% of our risk is due to unpatched Java, and you know, I would always hear comes well, I can't patch the job, I can't patch the job, it breaks too many things. But if I came to you, the CISO or the CEO or the board of directors, and said, hey, I found one problem that's 91% of our risk, if you told them that directly, they would probably help you get the resources and focus to fix that problem. So everybody is so overwhelmed by data and threats that nobody is looking at the relative, like every, I say in the book that everybody sees the attacks like bubbles in a glass of champagne or beer. <laughs> and the reality is two or three of those bubbles are so much bigger than everything else and they need to be focused as such, but nobody knows. Everybody's kind of overwhelmed, like, well, I gotta stop this, I gotta stop that, I gotta stop this, I gotta stop that. They're trying to do everything. And you know, what comes on the paper today, the Twitter hack or whatever, you know, oh my God, I gotta make sure that we can't be attacked by SIM swapping attacks or API abuse. And what happens is that you get hit. It's, it's a not, I think it's something like five to 17 new threats a day that the IT industry is told about. Told about and one quarter to one third of those have the highest criticality. So you're, you're, you're always getting this avalanche of information. And the reality is the average organization only faces about a dozen threats a year. You've brought so many different kind of discussion points there and I kind of want to break it down. Let, let's start off with the whole thing of really, you know, that 1% being the most critical. I think part of that has to do, and I think that's a very old school way of thought. I've actually personally seen it improve over the years now where CISOs are more focused on data and they're starting to understand the business aspect of their organization better, whether it be in a government mm -hmm. perspective or an enterprise or even a small mid-sized company because some a lot of these security folks are coming in and they have a little bit more of a understanding of the business, Good. right? I think the other part that plays into that is also the politics. In a mm -hmm. large enterprise, a CISO is typically the sales guy for security across the entire enterprise. So he's more, he's less managing his, his security. He's more managing the relationships along the board the executive leadership across different business units within the organization and his you know senior vice presidents vice presidents directors whatever the title under the C direct title that reports directly to the cios are the one managing it and a lot of times that that split uh, for example i know some organizations that have a vp of cyber defense well that's such a large so so is that everything because everything is cyber defense what is cyber defense yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 a great point, right? And so you end up in this in this um, uh, 
battle and everyone wants to say look at all these things we're doing but they're not doing any of the right things and that goes into leadership and i think we always we're always quick to talk in security about the threats and all of that but data data is driven by leadership and at the end of the day um if, if you have the wrong leader steering the ship uh, the ship is going to end up you know falling to a, a a common threat like an oracle java uh patching issue which but I, but I actually don't just blame the leader i think in many cases we're not effectively from the lower lines communicating the threats more appropriately upper because again, I think if you went to a leader and said, hey, 90% of our risk or 91% of our risk is this thing, that leader would help you solve that issue. So I think it's both, uh, but I do, so many times I don't think leaders are given the appropriate alignment of the risk, the proportionality of the different risks. Right. And people don't even, and maybe secondary big problem is people are said, people are told, hey, this is a huge risk. Like let's say meltdown inspector, huge risk, it affects every CPU, you know, most CPUs issued since, uh, created since 1990, and it, and it can completely take over your machine no matter what your operating system is. And if you don't have a patch, not only can you not stop these threats, but it, the event logs won't even uh, make it, a th you know, won't even note that the attack occurred and I can take over your machine and bypass any operating system defense. And you got to patch it, patch it, patch it. It's critical, critical, critical. Well, three years later, there's not been a single real world exploit of Meltdown Inspector. But if you run a software vulnerability patching report, they're gonna say it's critical that you get a patch, 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 patch. Like everything, again, a quarter to a third of everything is ranked with the highest criticality, and it just really isn't. If there hasn't been a single real world attack, is that really a super critical risk? Well, you're bringing up the chicken little you know, story yeah. where the sky's falling, the sky's falling, and so many vendors, when the time comes to patch a specific software, they want to give it a higher rating so people actually get it done because they don't want to be held liable for yeah. that vulnerability. So they're all screaming, the sky's falling and the sky's falling. And you and I both get, I think, pre I'm pretty sure we get the same email alerts on vulnerabilities daily. And every single one of them is the sky's falling, right? And every single one of them is you got to do this now. You got to, you know, we... We haven't seen anyone take advantage of it, but we can't control it once we've let out this <laughs> this uh, vulnerability report. And you're like, okay. And so I'm in one of those where when it comes to vulnerability management, you know, I have a chart of different components of my IT infrastructure and how critical and what data sits in different of the in different components of that IT infrastructure. And that's how I make my decisions on what's more urgent to patch. I don't care if it's a 9.9. .9. If it's a 9.9, .9, but it's not running anything critical in my organization, I'm not wasting time patching it right now. Yep. Yeah, but no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or well, I think that every bit of data I've seen, only 2% of CVEs, common vulnerability exploits, uh, are, are ever tried in the wild. And it's a pretty big indicator that if it hasn't been tried in the wild, your organization is not going to be impacted by it. Like you should at least see one in the wild case before you worry about something. So you can be worried about Meltdown Inspector because it has pretty big impact, but everybody rushed to patch it and ended up crushing the machines. It blue screened them, it caused performance problems. And the reality is that if people had looked at the risk, like, and, there, it, and interesting about that one is there was like 100 malware programs that people created to show how it could be wormed. So it was like, oh my God, it's getting ready to come. But no one stepped back and went, is there a single malware program that's ever been created that uses those exploits? No, I remember I was actually on site consulting for a big law firm at the time. And I told them, I don't think you need to patch uh, Meltdown Inspector right yet. There's some issues with the patches, maybe you can wait. And then for the only time in my career, I got walked out. The CISO said, Roger, thank you for coming. You're a great guy, love your books, but sorry, I'm trying to convince my board of directors that we need to hurry up and patch this. And I appreciate it, but thanks, have a good day. And I can understand I was speaking against his own interest. Uh, he applied those patches crushed his company. They had all kinds of problems <laughs> with the Windows and the Linux servers and everything. And again, three years later, no attacks. But And it wasn't like I was taking a guess. I had looked at the data. And let me say, there's a lot more data now around this. At least they can pick it up. There's a bunch of companies that all they do is look at the data about what's in the wild. Right. And and, and the data, I love that you talked about data. Like you just telling me that you're looking at, do you have the components in your organization running critical infrastructure? I mean, that is a great step, but there's even more data. Is it in the wild? You know, that sort of stuff. 
before you worry about it. Cause it's, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of chicken little risks that we're told. And uh, I love that you just said that you look at, hey, is it even in my environment before I panic? That's a, you know, that's a great step. Well, it's it's your IT inventory, right? Just use some common sense, folks. We don't need, like, you know, no one believed chicken little until the sky was actually falling. And I get it. I get where some CISOs don't want to be, just because I haven't seen it in the wild doesn't mean I want to ignore it because I don't want to be the guy that the wild tries it on and then I'm that guinea pig, right? When yeah. I should have patched and I, and, and I didn't, I, I see the other point of view, but then I always go go to that and I go, well, is this operating any critical parts of your business? Do you understand that your business really needs this? And I think a lot of times when we talk about data-driven defense, the discussion is, 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 people want to talk about fancy bolts and fancy machines and yeah. fancy data points but cybersecurity is about basic blocking and tackling the way you win a football game yes. the way you win a football game is with a good offensive and defensive line it's not you can have the best wide receiver on the planet we all remember some of the greatest you know running backs and and you know uh uh what's his name the guy from detroit um that retired really early. Barry, yes. um, um barry uh yeah. barry sanders yeah. Barry Sanders retired early. Why? Because he played on a shitty team that didn't have an offensive line. The guy had to dance because he had no one blocking for him. He yeah, retired yeah. early, right? So it, it's the same thing with CISOs. Everyone wants to have that fancy wide receiver. I'm using this fancy vendor and I'm using this fancy thing. That's great. No one is saying don't use it. But before you get a really good wide receiver or running back, is your offensive line any good? Is the your basic... Walk. The it's, Tampa Bucks are going to test that with Tom Brady this year, right? Right. <laughs> right. Let's see if Tampa Bay is able to block for Tom Brady because Tom Brady's played for the Patriots where they valued their offensive line. Every great successful coach that's ever been consistent, consistently successful in any sport has always had his base done right. I'm so, and you're right. I'm surprised at how many people are buying, like, I'll go to these companies and they're buying hundred thousand dollar appliances that do all these incredible things and i'll ask a simple question like okay the last time you were attacked it was an apt that took over one workstation then it uh, did pass the hash attacks got the hashes pretended to be that person went across the environment how does that device detect it and even the vendor i say i'll say to the vendor does this help stop the last attack they're like yeah yeah, yeah. So, so tell me how what alerts would occur how would it stop? And, and literally, most of the time, it doesn't. It would be this invisible attack or, you know, think about ransomware. It's not like ransomware is still routinely taking over companies everywhere and causing all kinds of, you know, mischief and, and damage. All those people are running up-to-date antivirus and endpoint defenses, and they're, they've got the crowd strikes and the appliances. And when it comes down to it, if you would focus on stopping social engineering and patching, you would have a far better chance of stopping the bad guy, right? I mean, it's like how many times, like with Equifax or Telex, did we got to read that someone didn't patch their web, Apache Struts web server or their VPN server or whatever it happens to be? You're like, there is a common thread. I've been I've been literally looking at it for 20 years, and it's almost it's almost accidental when it's something else. Not accidental, but you know, like you'll read about a vendor that got compromised because of SQL injection. And it's almost like, oh, well, it kind of hits you and startles you a little bit uh, because it's always unpatched software and social engineering. Like what happened at Twitter? I can tell you, I can tell you, probably social engineering and unpatched software. One of those two things led to that attack. And it looks like it was uh, social engineering with SimSwap, like, uh, like or, you know, with the, where they take over somebody's phone for a little while. That only occurs because of social engineering. Uh, but anyways, it, it's, it's, I love your idea because I go into companies and go, hey, what you need to do is just be better at the basics, better, be, be a better It's not blocker. fancy. No one, yeah. no, one, no one cheers you when you draft an offensive tackle in the top 10, right? No <laughs> one cheers you when you do that. But guess what? They're all thanking you late two years down the road when you're on your playoff run and you've got that monster of a tackle that's just – crushing that defensive end for the other team that's been wrecking havoc all year and you win the game yeah because, yeah exactly you know i mean it's it's i i always like to compare cyber whenever i get i talk about it i always like to compare it to something people can relate to so in this case we'll, we'll talk about football but in, in other cases you can talk about baseball and you can talk about 
so many other examples, you, you know, even fishing, um, <laughs> you know, you can go to the best place in the world to fish, but if, if you don't take the right bait, if you're not taking the right pole, you know, that doesn't matter, right? You're, you're going to strike out. You're, you're just, you're, you're against the elements. You're, you're against the odds. And so. And even the data, like, the, you know, when someone tells me, well, we got patching done 99%. But if the 1% is one of the most attacked software programs, you're having a hard time, Adobe Acrobat, or it used to be Java, or some add-in or something like that, that's properly attacked. Well, that risk, that 1% means every means far more than the 99%. No one's attacking your accounting program, you know, your cafeteria mill card program, but they are attacking your internet browser programs. And so right. if, you, if you don't have those patched, like you need to have them patched 100% or all the rest of the effort isn't nearly as you know worth it. So I mean, right, the basics, just basics. Yeah, well, and, and I think that's part of where a lot of times the discussion around what data is important for a CISO is a discussion that needs to be had. Because as of now, we don't have any standard KPIs in security that we can go to and say every CISO should be looking at those KPIs. In, fa in fact, when I talk to CISOs on my other podcast, CISO Talk, and I ask about KPIs or I ask about you know reports or how do you measure your your security progress, it's often you know like you said a ninety nine percent patching or the number of attacks we deflect today. But but those aren't real. Those aren't real KPIs. The real data driven KPIs is in your opinion what are some of those that you oh, think I, are I, critical yeah. data points yeah like one of my biggest ones uh so number one by far across all of this is how is your company successfully compromised the most and i don't mean by some uber hacker got in there or some big ransomware attack but in every environment especially large environments there is some amount of malware that lives for a couple of minutes to a couple of days before it gets detected and removed uh what how long did it live before it's removed your antivirus report is only going to tell you hey i detected these things here's the top 20 things we detected and removed but not how long they lived in your environment before they got removed because that's really where the risk is so i tell people as an example use an application control program like app locker or uh, what uh, used to be called bit nine parity but it's something else but there's lots of application control programs put them in there in audit only mode so that all they do is record when a new program that wasn't on your whitelist gets executed and then every time your antivirus program detects a virus compare okay this executable was a virus or a worm <laughs> not a virus but you know malware and it got removed how long had it been executing on that workstation before it got removed because that really determines your risk so what I like to tell people is the first thing that you should start to collect is how things got, how bad things got into your environment. Every environment is getting things that live for a few minutes to hours to days. No, answer, no, no defense is perfect. And when it got through, the number one thing any company can do is to learn how did it get through? Was it social engineering? Was it unpatched software? Was it misconfiguration? And if it's unpatched software, what software seemed to be what was being attacked? Most of the malware kits only attack a few exploits, few types of exploits each year. Which one are you having issues with? If it was social engineering, did it come through email? Did it come through a website that told someone to download some type of patch, a Google Chrome update? So number one stat that any company can collect is, how is my company getting successfully compromised the most, if only for a minute, and then start to shut down those root causes. So, and it really is funny, it's not that hard to figure out once you actually start to look. Like certain malware programs only get spread through certain exploits or certain ways. And a lot of times I even tell people, if you've got no system of collecting that data, ask the person that got compromised, you know, Bob, I see you have this malware program. Do you know how you got how it got on the system? And they'll go, you know, I think it's when I visited this car site and it told me that I had to download a codec to watch this car racing video. I think that's when it happened. So like literally sometimes just asking and get a sense of every time we're getting compromised, how is it? And I can tell you what's gonna happen because I've done it in hundreds of organizations. It's going to be social engineering, unpatched software, and then usually it's misconfiguration or you know misconfiguration on some workstation, some server, some device, incorrect uh, you know AWS storage permissions or something like that. 
But if you start to collect how you're being compromised as your most important metric, you can start to concentrate on it. it it's kind of like you're a military guy. Military is fighting all these different threats. But in any given year, they have one or two or three threats that are far more important than all the others. But in the computer security world, it's like we learn about, hey, here's our biggest threats. And then we keep fighting all the battles evenly instead of concentrating on the two, three, two, two or three biggest threats. Or can you imagine the military if they never looked to see well, how they were being like, they knew they were being attacked, knew they were being attacked, knew they were being attacked, but they didn't actually ask, how are they making it through the front lines? I mean, your military wouldn't exist. It couldn't exist. But in the computer security world, it's how we almost all operate. Oh, we got ransomware. We got ransomware again. You know, we got this. And, and no one's asking, how did the ransomware get in? Oh, wait, it passed a hash attack. Well, how did the person get in? How did it take over and, and capture everybody's password hashes and get domain admin? We're, we're very good about identifying threats. And you get your great antivirus report saying, here's the top 20 things that we got out of the system. But there is no antivirus report to tell you how it got into your environment and how long it thrived in your environment, you know, dwell time before it was removed. It is against their interest to tell you dwell time. Well, and, and part of that is because we're not asking the right questions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're happy to take the report they give us and go to our boss and say, look at this great software that we invested money in and look what it kept out and then that person takes it and goes up the Ooh. chain right and he goes up the chain and he goes see the money that we wanted for security it kept these 20 things out of our system and at the end of the day while a lot of people talk about ransomware i'm more concerned about business email compromise See, I find business email compromise to have a more direct impact on business operations because it not only has a direct financial impact on the company, it has the ability to create identity fraud and a lack of trust that a ransomware attack doesn't do for you. And that's, you know, whether it be, there was a story, um, I think six, seven months ago, where these um, um, cyber criminals out of China were able to... Uh, breach an email of a Hong Kong VC and an Israeli startup. And they essentially canceled the meeting between the two. So the Israeli wow. startup CEO was planning on flying to Shanghai to meet with the VC. And then the, uh, you know, CEO, they sent a, an email on behalf of the CEO saying, Hey, I had a family emergency come up. I can't come to Shanghai. And they intercepted the reply from the CEO of the VC saying, yeah, that's fine. You know, so-and-so. And then they said, hey, if you guys really want to invest, here's our wiring instructions. You know, they, they got a million dollars out of that. Or, you know, I, I love what you just said about people aren't asking the right questions. Uh, I'm probably going to uh, misphrase this, but Albert Einstein said, you know, if I was given a problem, an hour to solve a problem and my life depended upon it, I would spend 55 minutes thinking about the right questions to ask, because if I asked the right questions, I'd be able to solve it in the last five minutes, no problem. Right. And yeah, and that's that's absolutely essential. You know, like it's it, data. So the things I tell you ask, you know, what do I, what metrics do I think companies need to know? Number one, how are you being compromised successfully the most? And, and again, some, I don't mean just a major hacker brief, uh, you know, attack or ransomware or something, because every day in a large company, there's little microaggressions against the company that are being successful. And those are indicating gaps. Once you think about that way, when you find adware, right, typically you go, oh, it's only adware. They're just trying to direct us to some, you know, watch some cat video or some product in Viagra. We didn't need to worry about it. But the effort that it took the adware to get installed on the system is identical to the effort that it would take for some advanced persistent threat to get installed in your company. It's indicating gaps. So companies, most companies do not focus on the root causes of successful exploits. And then number two, they're not asking the right questions about how did it get in there? Let's say the antivirus one I talked about, the dwell time. When I help companies, uh, talk about dwell time. How long were these things living in your environment? Some of them are shocked to learn that the malware is in the system for two or three days. Sometimes ransomware is in people's systems on average, I think six to eight months. And if you don't know that, if you can start tracking it as a metric, like so every time you get a malware program that's detected and removed, you look to your application control program in audit only mode and find out when did that executable first get executed and determine dwell time. You can actually start to measure how long, first of all, risk on each workstation, like, hey, this virus was only on the system five seconds, we don't need to worry about it. 
hey, this thing was on the CISO's computer for three days before it got removed. They could have been learning a lot of information and spreading malware. That's a completely different risk. And the antivirus report, as it is today, we go, remove this virus from this CISO, remove this virus from this other system. And there's absolutely no difference in the risk that the antivirus report would give you based upon those two detected and removed events. And one is significantly more risky than the other. So ask the question, how long did it dwell and on whose system? Because if it, if it dwelled on a cafeteria worker system, it's not quite as important as if it was on a CISO computer or CSO or CIO or, or, or somebody else's computer, executive computer. And so I love your idea of ask the right questions and then make it a metric. So if you look at antivirus report versus the application control report, you figure out dwell time, you can figure out not only the dwell time for individual attacks, but is my antivirus software doing better or worse over time? In some companies, all of a sudden, the dwell time gets longer and longer. They take that data to their antivirus vendor, and because they have actualized, actionable data, they get less dwell time, right? Instead of just throwing their hands up in the air going, oh, it seems to be doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, we, we seem to be living in this, in, in, in this point in time where as an industry, we haven't standardized anything um, beyond the tools to buy and beyond the conversations to be had. But from a reporting perspective, you know, I think like if we look at some of the ISACs, uh, like the MS ISAC or the FS ISAC or, or many of the others, you know, you, you'd look to them right now and you'd, you know, if you'd say, what's the next big thing, big thing we need? It's not another framework. Um, we, we have enough frameworks. We don't need any more. It, it's it's the the KPIs, the reporting. L like let's create a standard across that that can carry out to the CFO, to the CEO, to the boards. Where if I you know I know multiple board members that sit on multiple boards, and so when they come and talk to me about security, it's never the same question. It's never the same report. It's never the same presentation. So they'll get something from the CISO because they'll be on the audit committee or they're leading the audit committee and they'll go, Hey James, take a look at this. Tell me what you think. I'm like, all right. And, and I look, I'll look at this board member who sits on five different companies as boards and all five presentations, all five metrics, they're all different. They're all over the place. It's, there's no standard. There's no way, you know, you measure a company's performance today by looking at key matrix metrics. Publicly traded companies all have the same key metrics. We don't have that in security. I haven't seen it yet. And I don't know no, if you have. Can you imagine the insurance industry if they didn't actually have actuarial tables driving what the rates are? That's what we have, right? Insurance insurance companies know exactly how many people of our age group are going to die in a given year, how many traffic accidents, what's the likelihood you're going to die slipping in your shower. They have all these metrics and they share and they make rates upon it. And we have none of that shared in our industry. Let me go further. You said you don't like frameworks. I'm glad we're starting to coalesce around maybe the NIST cybersecurity framework, but every framework I've ever seen, every compliance list is a list of 120 things with no relevance. And you're not even told really to make them relevant. Like I'll, I'll see two pages spent on storage encryption and two sentences spent on fighting social engineering. Like, like, and if the, if the, the compliance audit, gives a list of 20 things to the CISO that he has. These are the 20 critical things you got to go fix. Well, some of those things are significantly more risky. Like I talk to people, oh, we spent, Roger, what do you think about password policy? Should it be like the NIST password policy now, which is it can be short, doesn't have to be complex, and you should never change it? Or should it be long, complex, and frequently forced change? What should it be? I'm like, well, you know, I have my ideas, and I can tell you what I think it needs to be. What I can tell you is that it, your password complexity policy has about a one to at most 10% impact upon whether your company will be compromised in a given year. Do you have social engineering handled? Do you have your patching thing handled? Do you have your configuration of your AWS storage bins handled? Because those have far more impact. So it's so I was like, you, when you spend two days arguing about which password policy is gonna be, but you haven't really figured out the, the top two things, you're wasting time. And that's my problem with cyber frameworks. That's my pro problem with compliance. The auditor says, here's these 20 things you gotta go fix, and they're all high risk. <laughs> it is not. It is not all high risk. 
It's, it's like we just pull the actuarial tables out of the insurance agency and try to get them to be profitable. So not only do we not have KPIs, I love it, we're not even giving the right, we're not giving any true risk assignments to the actions that if we even had the KPIs, because KPI would just go, oh, you have these one million things you need to go patch in your organization. No, no, you don't have one million things to patch. You need to patch your internet browser helpers and operating systems first and foremost on your servers, web server software, operating server software, and remote management software. Those are the three things that are exploited the most. You need to go fix those things first. Yeah, it's... Um it's interesting. Um, a good friend of mine, the chief information security officer for Data Bank, Mark Hopped, um, we were having a conversation when people could still get together. Uh, this is pre-COVID. Um, five months ago, we were in Dallas together, and we did our Cyber State of the Union. And in an off-the-record, and kind of, we didn't record this, but we we're talking about what CISOs need to do in order to be successfully working with their auditors. Because so many times an auditor comes in, and especially if it's one of the big firms, they just have an Excel sheet that they, yes, no, yes, no, remarks, yes, no, yes, no, remarks, yes, no, remarks, uh, from one to five, uh, <laughs> four, why? And th there's no, you know, and, and as a CISO, when you hire an auditor to to audit you, you, you really want to ensure that they understand what how to look at things right because like you said they'll give you a top five you know an auditor is always looking to i always like to say that an auditor is like a a, a very uh, uh the, the person who can always monday morning quarterback the guy who's writing the column after the game right they're not part of the game they come in and they just go you're doing all these things you should do these better <laughs> yeah but did you really look overall or did you just go through a checklist yeah are you ready for this i think Sometimes the auditor and us lie to each other just so we get the check mark and it's wink, wink, we've got this handled. One of my best examples is we have fully tested backups. It's on every audit compliance checklist I've ever seen in my world. Hey, do you have a backup of all your critical systems and have you fully tested or restore? And everybody's like, yes. It truly is almost impossible to do a fully tested restore on the complex systems we have today. You have to, I mean, imagine all the complexity, front end, back end, databases, namespaces, DNS. And so the auditor asks the question, do you have fully you know, tested, do you have critical backups and you fully tested them? And the person's like, yes. What he means is he, re he restored three files four months ago for Liz and accounting. And well, th th there's no better proof of that than watch a company that doesn't pay to ransomware and then it's got to go fully restore. And it yeah, takes them yeah, three yeah. to four weeks to fully restore. I, I think ransomware has literally told us how much we've been lying to each other. I think everybody knows we don't really test the backups. Like everybody, but we just want to get past that checklist. And and let's say even if it wasn't, suppose they were actually honest with, oh, you don't really test your backups or something. And they go, you need to do that. Well, it's one of 20. And they're going to go tackle the easier thing because to fully test your backup and your restore in a ransomware event could mean that you have to buy duplicate hardware, double the hardware, pay for double the environment. I mean, to truly test the full restore of everything that would be involved in a particular critical system is a very expensive proposition in both hardware, cloud cost, resources. Imagine your IT guys. If you if they really did this, did fully tested restores, it would probably take up, uh, I don't know, one fifth of their time. And yet they're just told to do it as part of their time. Well, I mean, and, and I think that's one of those where as as consumers, we have to be able to go to our cloud providers and say, you need to allow us as part of what we do to be able to run these tests, maybe at, at an exuberantly discounted cost, because you have to realize that we got to run this test every so often. That's, I love that. I actually have not thought about that. And that is brilliant. That's like, brilliant. Like if more and more, if more and more companies went and did that and you went, you know, with AWS, it's really funny, but I, I've learned this the hard way. I'm a CISO right now for a company and we're dealing with AWS. There's no one to really talk to in AWS. The more you pay, the more people you talk to, right? But you got to pay <laughs> to talk to people. And with other data centers, with other cloud providers, that's not always, um, that's not always the case. You, you, you do have more flexibility. Um, in talking to people. And so, you know, you're able to go to your cloud provider and say, we want to be able to do a full backup or store. Um, you know, how can you guys help us with this? And, and you'll see that the smaller providers are willing to work with you on it. 
But the big ones, the Azures, the Google, the AWS, they're machines that they're, they're not built for this at all. They don't really. And I'm gonna tell you, we have it. We have it. We have it. It's covered. You don't have to worry about it, right? It's not. There's a big difference between being told I don't have to worry about it. No, now my systems are all locked up with ransomware, and I need you to show me this. I mean, I think it really ransomware. If it's done nothing, if there's one positive thing about ransomware, it is laid bare that we've been lying to each other for 20 years about our back. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a good point that you bring up there. It's. Uh... It's it's not only that we're lying to each other about backups, but we're also lying to each other about the time to restore. If you look at every incident response plan, right? And it says, what's our restore time, right? Um, yeah. And and you see you see the you see the you look at the report and the report says, oh, our restore time is two and a half days. In two and a half days, we can be back up and running. And then the real thing happens. And two and a half days later, right? we're not even at 5% capacity. Yeah, we have to hire external staff to help us do the restoration and then the recovery after the restoration. Right. It, that's the reality. Right. I, I've been through so many different tabletop exercises and so many different incident response plans and business continuity plans. And since COVID, you know, I just I recently did one and, you know, we were talking about business continuity and I said, well, what's our restore time? And someone looked at me and they go, well, probably three days. And I go, you're full of crap. Probably more like three weeks. All right, let's be real here. Don't don't say three days now. And then when something bad happens, we're going to blame it on all these different vendors and all these different things. We have to account for it now. If it's three weeks, let it be three weeks. But at least we can plan for those three weeks. We we know what departments need to do what in, you know, who's going to go online first. Yeah. So let me. So you're talking about like the, the lack of leadership. What I'm saying is that you, I think you had a great example of where the staff isn't really giving full information to the leaders because I think if if it was a, a compliance requirement and the staff said, "Hey, it's going to take three weeks," or I've never imagine the staff saying, "We have never truly done a test," that there's a potential the leader would say, "Okay." I didn't realize that we now have to take the, the steps and the resources and the actions because we've, we've, we've committed to this as part of our business continuity plan and disaster recovery and all. We should really do a test. And then everybody finds out, including the IT person, persons, the team, how long it really takes because I bet what you just said, 99% of IT staffs believe that it would take a day or three days. <laughs> There's probably people out there, I think we could do it in three hours, you know? Like they don't know the reality of what you just said because they haven't even done it once. Be like Missouri, do it once. Well, and, and I don't think it's it's that they haven't done it once. I think that everyone thinks it's really easy to do it, mm -hmm. right? Um, when we think of a backup and restore, we think of switching laptops, right? And you go to the you go to the Apple Store and you load your iCloud account and you connect it to your Ethernet port and, you know, lo and behold, here's all your files and documents. Well, that took a few hours. Well, in our company, we've got better computing power, so we can probably do the same in a day or two. But not notwithstanding all these different applications and all these different things that hinge, that, that work, that are intertwined and interwork together, that lack the complexity and the sophistication of people understanding how to really do it. Mm -hmm. And Perfect. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think that is a great example of it's a little bit of everything. The IT guy is saying three, he's taking his best guess. He doesn't know. He's never done it. And the reality is he's never been given the time or the resources to actually do it. If he actually went to his boss and went, hey, we need to pay this cloud provider some time and money and resources and test a full restore, actually see it working in this test environment. Well, that's a, got a real cost associated with it. And he's he's already put in the bid. Oh, this thing cost a hundred thousand dollars. Now you have to go back. And go, oh, it's actually one hundred and twenty for this test system. We may never use. So they never try it, and they've been told by their vendor many times. Been told by their vendor. Yep, we back up everything. We back. Well, the vendor means we back up what's in the cloud, but maybe they don't back up Azure AD. Maybe they don't back up their DNS. You know, all the things that could be involved in it. Well, so, it's, 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 it's also looking at how you, you structure your cloud infrastructure today, right? When you look at your cloud infrastructure today, so many people are into EC, EC instances and it's getting away from EC instances, instances, it's going into serverless. It's trying to, you know, really 
increase the lower your computing costs while increasing your performance which at the, at the back end of all of this leads to a quicker uptime right when something does happen because you're working on a serverless environment per se and so you're able to to really launch specific critical programs quicker than if you would and having to readjust your instances all over again and doing all these things but a lot of times security itself isn't injecting itself in that devops process it's not given a seat at the table when they're making those decisions and so security ends up having to restore systems that are 10 years old that don't have support anymore Right. We're, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're seeing this right now. And, and I'll give you a classic example is Magento 1.0, right? Adobe bought the online store Magento and they retired it on June 30th. Um, and on June, th- I remember on July 2nd, I did a practitioner brief and there were still 200,000 stores that were still operating on Magento 1.0. And they've been given a six wow. month notice to upgrade to a 2.0 version. Wow. With the critical vulnerability being card skimming, the payment side of this. So Mm. I know, like, I want to support small business. No one wants to support local small business more than yours truly. But if I go to your website and I see that you're operating on a Magento 1.0, I'm not only not buying from you, I'm probably boycotting you. Mm. Because you don't care about my security as a consumer. You're blatantly ignoring my security as a consumer. That's like going into a kitchen that has a D, going into a restaurant with a D on the window. You're not going to that restaurant with a D on the window. No one goes to those places. (laughs) Or at least you know what you're getting. Well, yeah, and you're like, oh, uh, I found a hair in my nachos. Yeah, you went to a place with a D on the window. They're not exactly known for their cleanliness. I mean, it's, it's, it's... Security has still so much maturity to go. Yes, we're getting better, but we have so much more maturity and really maximizing data to our advantage. I had on and and, uh, someone who you'd really enjoy speaking with is Kosar Kenning. She's the um, SVP at E-Trade and she's on the cyber data analytics side. So her entire work is around building data pools in order to give the um, infosec team better data in order to make better decisions around the security program my kind of people your kind of people i have to connect you to you guys would have a great conversation and i had kosar on the podcast um, on our sister talk podcast literally a few months ago so definitely something you should go back and listen to roger because i think you'd re- a lot of the stuff that she talks about really does resonate she's talking about you know how do we start looking at different data points beyond the tools that are within our infosec. How do we start to look at IT tools, at marketing tools, at sales tools, and utilizing those tools in order to build a better security program? Well, listen, and let me, and I know we're kind of coming to the end of our time, but my differentiator between what I, when I talk to somebody like her is, do they just repeat the risk scores? Like they're told, oh, here's all these high critical things. Or, or do they take, like you talked about before, you're taking these other metrics that to me is the difference between a smart IT security person and someone that is just taking status quo is making sure you put in all the risk, the true risk factors. You don't just take some vendor's acclamation, legal acclamation. This is high risk, but it's never when there's no public exploits and it's never been exploited in 10 years and keep it at a critical risk. So I, I love people that not only take the data, but also question the validity of some of the measurements. Like, do you got a good backup? You say you've got a good backup, you've done tested restores. What does that really mean? What does I've tested the restores mean? <laughs> because that answer really is everything about the risk. Absolutely. And um, and, and and she's definitely your type of gal. I will say mm-hmm. that she, she questions every piece of data. She questions everything that comes to her desk. And she questions the validity of the data before she even looks at the data and, and considers it as part of her equation. And I think that's what oh. makes a good data analytics person is you look at the data and you don't really trust its source until you're able to validate it. So, and if you don't can't have validation behind that data, then that data is meaningless to you. It's, it's, it's numbers on an Excel that someone put there. Um, yeah. yeah, perfect. 
it, it makes no sense. We are at the end of our time, folks. Um, Roger, thanks so much for coming on. We'll have you on again, I am sure. I will make a request of Megan right now, like bring Roger back again. Um, uh, I tell you what, you're you're very. Uh, I think you get security better than anyone I've talked to in 20 years. Thank you. I'm not saying that lightly. I don't lie to people. Uh, I, I I talk to a lot of people. You get it. Thank you. I I really do appreciate that. Folks, um, the one, the only, the author, the legend, the the good luck at Black Hat, uh, Roger Grimes. We're very excited to have him on. Let us know your feedback. You can do that in the comment section below on this video on your favorite podcast listening platform. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can do it right below here on the video. Um, If you're a troll, we're blocking you. Just saying it right now. If you don't have anything good to say, if you just say this is stupid, I'm blocking you. Have some content for your answer. If you think we're dumb, support it with facts. We'd love to have that discussion. I'm all for discussion. Folks know I've debated people on all kinds of topics. I'm all for debate around security. I think more debate brings more action. We're not just randomly talking. We're talking to really uh, improve our industry as a whole um, from within and not letting outsiders really do that. So please do so. Folks, we're going to be back with more Tech Corner next week. We're back from vacation, back into the grind of things. I'm back from Israel. I'm very excited to be back home in my studio with my lovely mic and not my travel mic and all and and, and solid internet. I have to say, Roger, the hardest part of traveling internationally is getting good. You, like you do not appreciate good internet until you travel somewhere. I agree. I agree. Folks, that's it for us here today. James Azar, Roger Grimes. We'll be back with more next week. Until then, folks, make sure you subscribe. Give us five stars on your favorite podcast listening platform. We'll be back with more next week. And folks, most importantly, stay cyber safe.